In addition to studying uh, a shame response and a guilt response, Joan, June Tangney has um, studied our tendency towards those sort of responses. Um, and she uh, categorises people as being predominantly shame prone or predominant, predominantly guilt prone. Um, and in fact, she says that in most situations where we're on a spectrum from uh, complete shame proneness, where we tend to turn everything into ourselves um, and, and blame ourselves, uh, to being completely guilt prone, where we focus more on uh, growth and change um, that's indicated by the triggering of the shame affect. Um, and she studied uh, three populations. Um, one was a longitudinal study uh, starting with students in year five um, where she uh, used an instrument to determine their shame proneness and then followed them through uh, through high school um, the second one was a study of of prisoners incarcerated in the u.s um, and looking at what happened on their release um, and the third one was just a random group of people that she um, studied uh, in an airport lounge um, and um, built up quite a bank of um, experiences and, and uh, stories uh, from people that she studied in that context. Um, what she found was that people who are predominantly shame prone uh, on her instrument um, were more likely to be um, uh, associated with self-oriented distress when something goes wrong, um, whereas the guilt prone people were more associated with other focused empathy. Um, that shame prone people were more likely to, uh, more prone to anger and hostility. Um, that over time, uh, shame proneness, the tendency to uh, reflect badly on yourself, uh, she found no evidence of that inhibiting immoral behavior. Uh, but she found that guilt proneness, the, the, the um, tendency to uh, reach out to others and, and try and make amends, uh, inhibited immoral behaviour. Um, and in the prison populations, it predicted reduced recidivism, that um, guilt prone prisoners were less likely to reoffend um, when, uh, when released. Uh, in the result of the uh, student study, um, she found that shame proneness was associated with a lot of negative outcomes, uh, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, eating disorders, suicidal ideation, um, things like um, earlier uh, uh, teen drug use, alcohol use, uh, unprotected sex, um, all those sort of um, risk factors in adolescence uh, were more associated with shame proneness than guilt proneness. Uh, she found the guilt prone kids later in high school uh, had greater levels of psychological resilience. Um, they achieved better. Um, and overall, she found that shame proneness resulted in significantly poorer psychological and social outcomes over time. So, and that led her to write that uh, considering the welfare of the individual uh, and their relationships and the good of society in general, Guilt is the moral emotion of choice. Uh, guilt is the emotion of choice over shame. So it comes down to a tendency to evaluate the self versus evaluating behavior. Um, in conversations with um, June Tangney uh, about seven years ago, uh, I explored the issue that shame proneness may in fact be the human default position um, because she makes the point that it's it's very difficult for a, a young child to separate self from behavior. Uh, if you have a very young child who's done something wrong, um, simply uh, expressing to them that you're concerned about the behavior, not about them, um, that you know the behavior is wrong and, and love the sinner, hate the sin sort of stuff. Um, she, her study seemed to show that very young children can't distinguish that we can be very careful to say, um, you know, that what you've done is wrong um, and you need to change that. Um, but what the kid walks away hearing is that mummy or daddy is very upset with him. Um, that, and that becomes a shame prone response. Um, the environment or experiences that kid has, if that is a default position, 
um, then determines any movement towards a guilt-prone uh, response, a guilt-prone way of living. Um, and as I said, young people need help. Um, she recommends that uh, instead of making the distinction between behaviour and, and the person with very young kids, um, you know, uh, um, preschool age and, and um, grade one and two, um, she suggests that we focus on helping them to make amends um, and that this is true even later in school life and this is where RP comes in, the, the focus on the harm that's been done and, and trying to repair that harm um, moves people from a shame prone response to a guilt prone response. Now I've spoken at length in other, uh, other forums about the fact that RP, the, the questions in RP, the sequence in, the, in an RP conversation takes people from a shame prone response um, where we ask uh, about them uh, towards a guilt prone response where the focus moves to the harm that's been done and how to repair it. Um, and that's built into an RP response. Um, but keep in mind that this shame and guilt response can be prompted not just by what we've done wrong, but also when things go wrong, when things happen outside our control that impede our enjoyment of uh, interest or, or enjoyment. Um, so the takeaway for this is that we can, we can learn good ways of responding ourselves. We can deliberately make a more guilt prone response but we can also teach good ways of responding. Um, and we teach that through our developmental relationships. Um, how we encourage the boys to respond when things go wrong is how we encourage grit and resilience um, and psychological balance uh, and a guilt-like response rather than a shame-like response. Um, and that's not in our uh, PD classes or you know, in special presentations, that's all day every day. How we, re, how we encourage the boys to respond um, can move them from a predominantly shame-prone response to a predominantly guilt-prone response. And Tangney's work suggests that that will have significant psychological benefits and social benefits uh, for these kids down the track. Um, certainly Dweck, Carol Dweck would say that what you're building is a growth mindset and that will lead to greater um, academic success and um, satisfaction and fulfilment later in life. Um, so even when we haven't done something wrong, uh, but shame, humiliation, affect is triggered, we still have these two responses. Okay, If things just suck through no fault of our own, we can have an attack self, a withdrawal, or an avoidance or an attack other response at the emotional level, or we can focus on pushing through. Um, and pushing through is about using the affect interest to, to overcome the, um, uh, the negative feelings that come from the shame affect. And we call those things in educational circles, we call these grit or resilience or perseverance or Carol Dweck's growth mindset. And it's interesting that um, Tangney's also studied positive emotions. And even when things go right, we can still make this um, two-sided attribution. You know, if a, if a young player uh, in a team wins a competition or something like that, they can put that down to themselves or they can put that down to how they worked and their behavior. Um, and she distinguishes these two as hubristic pride or hubris and authentic pride. Um, the, the hubris says we won because we're great, we're special, we're entitled, you know, we're, we're Villanova. Um, the authentic pride, the authentic attribution um, says, well, we worked hard, we adapted, we, we worked as a team, we listened to one another. Uh, in other words, we, it attributes it to our behavior and things that we can um, keep going with or change. Um, the hubristic pride offers no change for the future, offers no growth. Um, we won because we're great means we don't have to train, we don't have to prepare. Um, and it's interesting that um, Tangney and, and others found 
uh, similar negative consequences for the self-attribution, for the hubristic pride, as they found in the negative case for shame. Um, so that gives us another spin. You know, when, when kids have success, what do we put it down to? Um, and this echoes Carol Dweck's uh, work in fixed mindsets and, and growth mindsets. We don't want the kids to think, because it's dangerous for them to think, uh, that they you know, top the class because they're brilliant. Um, well, that sets up a whole lot of problems in the future, as we know. Um, we want them to understand that it's not just because of effort, but it's because of the strategies they used, and there are more strategies that they can use. So uh, Tangney um, concludes that authentic pride is the more moral and pro-social achievement oriented form of the emotion. And Carol Dweck would agree with that. So what about in the classroom, in learning, in the learning process itself, where you're actually trying to get kids to understand, be able to do things? Uh, is shame affect triggered there? Well, of course it is. Um, we would hope in the classroom that there's interest, excitement and enjoyment, joy being triggered, that the two positive affects are part of the kids' experience and our experience in the classroom. Um, we know that when we're explaining to some, uh, something to the kids and, and they're working it out, um, that promotes positive affect. Um, in fact, Marzano in, in the new taxonomy um, talks about the self system and the metacognitive system being uh, the, the the roads to the cognitive system. In other words, kids don't engage with a project or with a task or with a learning exercise um, unless they believe it has value to them, unless they believe they, they're going to be reasonably competent at it eventually, um, unless they can see a purpose to it. And that's part of the self system. That's saying unless interest excitement is, is triggered um, they're not going to engage um, and once they do engage and they meet with some success then that triggers enjoyment joy contentment uh, satisfaction uh, a sense of uh, authentic pride in, in achieving something now while we want those things to be operating in the classroom any impediment to these positive affects is going to trigger shame so anytime they find that something's a bit too hard or they're not following you or or um, they can't get this work, uh, then that's shame affect being triggered. And what you'll see in those cases, uh, disappointed, rejected, confused kids, um, they'll be embarrassed, they'll give the wrong answer in class, they'll blush, they'll have the, the normal physiological responses of shame. And the interesting thing is that, as I said before, shame is a relationship um, emotion or, or affect because it's normally experienced in relation to other people. Uh, the shame affect is magnified in the classroom because it's so visible, because it's so obvious that the kid got the question wrong or that the kid's blushing or that the kid's, you know, dropped his head. Um, that kid knows that everybody can see that and that makes it more painful. Um, so are there guilt-like and shame-like responses in the classroom? Yeah, of course there are. Um, we would call them a fixed mindset and a, and a growth mindset. Um, the adaptive response, the guilt-like response, uh, is to, um, to look at what am I doing? Should I ask some more questions? Should I think more clearly about this? Should I read something? Should I do some research? In other words, what change in behaviour will get me around this and back to interest uh, enjoy and enjoyment? Um, and the, that's the key, to, to use interest affect to push through the confusion. Now that interest affect can be twofold. It can be in the work, that is we can say things to make the kids, when, when, they've, when they've stumbled, uh, we can say things to make the kids more interested in the work. In other words, we can ask questions, well, can you explain this part of it or can you, can you find out how this works? Um, so we can use interest in the work, but we can also use interest in the relationship. The kids are interested in us being interested in them. Um, and therefore, the interest we show in their progress might be just enough to get them to push through the shame affect being triggered in some negative situation and to get back on task. 
Um, we're also interested in the kids being interested in us. So it's a two-way street. We need to recognise that in a developmental relationship, as I said in July, um, these are two-way relationships. It's just that we have a purpose in our developmental relationships. We, the adults, have a purpose, and that is to promote the development of the young person. So we could say to take a guilt-like response is to employ a growth mindset, and we could really explore that in more detail. Um, not all students are resilient, okay, but we can teach them how to be more resilient. Um, the ones that aren't resilient uh, are going to tend to make um, more of a shame-like response. What we want to encourage is a guilt-like response, and and there's mounting evidence, um, particularly in the study of physics and, and in university courses, there's mounting evidence that it is the learning process is about overcoming the shame. Um, and that overcoming the shame is in fact critical to deep learning. That if, if the student doesn't in, encounter any difficulty or, or um, challenge in their learning, uh, it's going to be very superficial. Um, so, I, and I've been doing this for a while, I, I introduce specific difficulty in some topics just so that the kids have to struggle with it. And once they struggle with it, they get a much better understanding. Uh, it's called Desirable Difficulty, uh, and a group from a university in Melbourne, I think it's Monash, um, have actually developed a font that makes it hard to read. Uh, and what they found in their studies, the font's called Sans Forgetica, without forgetting. Um, and it makes it difficult to read, as you can see on the slide. Um, but it, uh, what they found in the studies is that students who use it on their revision notes recall better because they've had to struggle to read. Um, and that's a continual shame experience that the kids are overcoming or the students are overcoming in that uh, in that example study. So if that's the, the sort of guilt-like response to shame in learning, what's the, what's the maladaptive response? What's the shame-like one? Well, it's the compass of shame. Uh, kids who withdraw from the task or attack themselves, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do maths. Um, or avoid that, that they put all their identity into some other aspect of, of their school life, or they attack other, you know, this is shit, this is rubbish, you, what are you teaching us this for? You can't teach, this is hopeless, um, it's a waste of time. We've all seen those responses, and they happen all the time. Um, what are they saying? They're saying, I'm vulnerable, I'm not understanding, I'm not getting this. The best thing we can do is to read that information. The worst thing we can do is just to respond to the attack other or attack self or, or withdrawal or avoidance um, because that doesn't attack the problem. The problem is the vulnerability behind that. The problem is that the kid is not understanding it. And these are call signs. These, these are signs of help, uh, requests for help. Um, when we see kids attack other, we need to ask, what, what are you not understanding? What are you not getting in this class? Um, it's interesting that this can very easily become a chronic pattern, a, a chronic shame, um, where a student convinces themselves that they just can't do maths or they can't do English or, or whatever. Um, and what it eventually leads to is um, a student who's totally disengaged um, because they have that fixed mindset that um, I'm, I suck at maths, so I'm just not going to be able to do it. Um, and that stops them before they even try. Uh, the only antidote to shame, and this is true in the classroom anyway, the only antidote to shame affect, the vulnerable, terrible feeling of shame affect being triggered, uh, is empathy. Somebody else under, uh, seeming to understand uh, a little of what you're going through uh, is... Um, cuts through shame affect like a knife. Um, so what do we do when a kid experiences shame affect in a classroom, you know, and he acts out according to one of the four poles of the compass? Um, well, we acknowledge the confusion in, in whatever is appropriate way to do that. Um, and when it's appropriate, we share from the teacher's own experience. Oh, yeah, when I get that wrong, I tend to do this. In other words, move it to a strategy from our own experience that not only uh, expresses empathy, but gives the kids something to work 
towards that that's interest um, the kids are interested in us being interested in them and sharing with them how we overcome obstacles um, and giving them strategies in the meantime in in, in the process of doing that um, builds their interest in the relationship so the the key thing is emphasizing strategies to push through um, and that's the purpose of that is to, is to get back to interest away from the impediment uh, to interest so the real takeaway from this part is how we respond when students are in a shame episode <coughs> pardon me will guide their responses um, when they're in a shame episode we need to see remember it's regulate relate reason uh, we need to see that they need regulation first of all okay if a kid's in attack other um, or attack self um, they need regulate they need us to help them co-regulate which means empathy which means yeah I'll just sit with you for a minute I'm not going to try and reason with you until you've calmed down um, and we can teach them to have better scripts we can teach them and challenge them to move from a shame proneness to a guilt proneness and Tangney and others say that that's going to have an enormous effect psychologically socially and academically down the track uh, and Carol Drake uh, would agree in terms of the, the growth mindset development um, but and this might be uncomfortable but what about us do things ever go wrong for us in the classroom um, are we ever frustrated disappointed or tired uh, uh, you know do things fail to go to plan we've, we've spent all night preparing a lesson um, and it's over in 50 minutes and it was a disaster um, wh what do we do how do we respond you know can we reflect and learn about that in other words can we take a guilt-like response and, and look at behaviors and take a growth mindset approach or are we stuck in um, ways of denying and bypassing that shame affect by withdrawing or attacking self or avoiding or attack other you know those kids suck they just didn't take any notice of what I was doing um, how, do, how do we respond when we walk back into the staff room um, after a lesson that hasn't gone well or, or after an interaction that hasn't gone perfectly uh, so it, it's interesting and I think one of the ways that we can stop ourselves automatically um, jumping to a compass of shame response and, and I try to do this as often as I can is use the peace process what I call the peace process and I don't know where I got this from but it, it, I find it very helpful and we can teach kids to do this too peace is an acronym so it's pause exhale aware choose and engage um, and it means physically uh, I have this poster on my classroom wall um, to remind us all because um, we need to train ourselves to do this it's not the automatic response but first of all something goes wrong pause stop step back just exhale just take a breath um, become aware I'm angry I'm frustrated uh, you know I'm alarmed um, whatever the whatever the sensation is become aware of the emotion just become aware that you're angry um, because if you become aware that you're angry two things you're naming it to tame it and secondly uh, you start to be curious about well why am I angry what's really going on here um, so you can stop and choose you know am I just going to fly off the handle or am I going to think no hang on what this kid's done is just an indicator that he's not getting it how can I help him get it um, and then engage uh, and then get back to what you were doing um, now I find that I can do the peace process in about 15 seconds flat um, and I'm sure some of you probably do it more rapidly and more effectively than that um, but the important thing is that kids get this um, kids get it as a way of, of responding or a way of controlling our response it's a way of self-regulating and remember Marzano said self-regulation is, is should be the key uh, should be the goal of education um, and Steinberg said that it has self-regulation is more effective in, in academic terms um, than any other uh, ability of the student um, so this is a really critical one I think so what are the takeaways from here well how we respond when shame affect is triggered in us um, can model it for the students um, we can choose to de-escalate things we can be their prefrontal cortex we can have that sort of developmental relationship where we take charge and um, encourage the kids to 
develop in an appropriate and positive way. Um, so just to summarise, um, what we've been talking about is attribution of, of both positive and negative things to the self or to our behaviour. Um, and in the negative emotion, that distinction is between shame and guilt. In the positive emotion, it was between hubristic pride and authentic pride. And in the academic sphere, we've we've used the terms more commonly fixed mindset and growth mindset. Um, so it all fits together. There are eight takeaways um, from this presentation that we've seen as we went through, and I'll just summarise them again. Um, and I think this is the overall one. The power of relationships and power of developmental relationships will always dwarf all other pedagogical strategies. And it doesn't matter what else you use, it'll be more effective if you've got strong relationships. What we feel, think and do is a product of our biology and our biography. And we need to be attentive to both. Um, shame affect is triggered in everyone hundreds of times each day and it feels crappy for everyone. And it's triggered to alert us to something we need to pay attention to, something we need to learn or to do. It's a good thing, even though it feels terrible. Um, there are good ways and there are bad ways of responding to the shame epic being triggered. Uh, adaptive ways are things that look at our behaviour, look at others' behaviour, look at the situation, stop and pause, reflect and allow us to, to choose our way. And the maladaptive ways are all about the four compass of shame sets of scripts. Um, so we can change the way we respond to shame affect and we can teach good ways of responding through our developmental relationships. Um, and how we respond will help the students learn to respond. We can teach them to have better scripts. Um, we can model it uh, for students. Um, we can de-escalate situations uh, and we can be their prefrontal cortex, uh, as we said, in terms of the developmental relationships. So that's the theory. Um, that's what I think we need to understand in terms of uh, dealing with shame affect with kids. Uh, I'd like to leave you with some questions to consider before we look at um, practical ways of, of doing all of these things. Um, so what particular shame triggers are going to be likely for our incoming year five students in the first few weeks? And what's going to be different for the returning year sixes? So what impediments to positive affect is there going to be for these two groups of kids? Um, and even within the year fives, you know, there's going to be kids who come from uh, schools where there's only one or two others and they didn't really get on with them there. Uh, there's going to be kids who come from schools where we might have 15 or, or 20 kids from one school or something like that. The situation is going to be different. What what shame triggers are likely. Um, this might be more interesting for you. What situations are likely to trigger shame affect in us, in you, for the first few weeks? Um, what can we do to best encourage kids to take an adaptive response to shame affect being triggered? So in those situations that you think might arise, how can we express empathy? How can we cut through the shame and get the kids back to interest or enjoyment? Um, what specific things can we do to encourage belonging and significance? In other words, moving up the Maslow hierarchy from, from safety and security. Um, what can we do to make kids feel at home that we don't already do? Um, how can we best try to maximise positive affect and minimise negative affect for the kids? And how can we assist each other as colleagues in making guilt response the standard go-to response in the junior school over the shame response? How can we focus so much on behaviour and, and what we do, strategies, um, that kids are challenged to move away from thinking it's just how they are? 